Hello and welcome to the first episode of Talk on the Pitch with Kevin and Tyler. This is a PRC fan show show and what it's going to feature is Tyler Terrans, the voice of the Phoenix Rising, who also does play-by-play -play for all sorts of teams across the nation, and myself talking all things Phoenix Rising game-wise, USL-wise, and MLS. And of course in this episode a little bit of the World Cup too. Tyler offers a unique perspective and really knows his stuff. And I'm really looking forward to this because I think we're going to be able to offer some perspectives and some angles that you're not going to find anywhere else. So we're going to get right to it. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, so here we are. It is a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Tyler, welcome. Thank you. It Glad is, to be back. Oh, it is great to have you on the show. Um, we had so much good feedback uh, from uh, the fans of the show about you being on it. Um, I'm just happy to have you here, and this is going to be a continuous thing, and I'm, I'm ecstatic. Um, thank Maybe you so much. Rocking. So uh, did you watch the World Cup game today, France uh, versus Belgium? Unfortunately, I did, yes. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> uh, so really, France showed up. Did you think Belgium showed up? Um, I thought one or two players showed up. I thought when Mertens came on, he showed up. Yeah. I think, De I mean, De Bruyne, when he's on the ball, although at times I thought he was receiving it way, way, way too deep. I mean, because there's no, there was no connection in the middle of the field. I thought Fellaini was crap, but that's, you know, no news to anybody. Um, Lukaku disappeared. I was very, I mean, like, to throw away the fact that I had a decent amount of money on Belgium to win the whole thing. I, I, I was just very upset with their performance in general because I expected a much better show. We are both in the same boat then. Uh, I, yeah, I was, uh, you know, Fellini to me is a walking black hole. Um, <laughs> and I was getting crap from people because I was just like making comments. Uh, we were at the Thirsty Lion watching the game and, uh, I, I don't understand what that was. Uh, De Bruyne had decided to not really show up much. Uh, neither did Lukaku. It was just, I just watched my money slowly fade away. <laughs> it was very sad. So any other surprises from the World Cup or, or highlights that you enjoyed? Um, I mean, I, England has obviously been great. And I, I mean, they were sort of my team that I was rooting for, you know, with the United States not being in just because I watched so much EPL and I just love the likes of Harry Kane, I love Stones, I love Harry Maguire. Fun guys. Uh, and I and I was I was really impressed with them in penalties because like all you know the broadcasters are talking about is how much they worked on penalties over the past couple of years, mm -hmm. and it sh like it hundred percent showed. And even Henderson's wasn't a bad penalty. I mean, he missed it and it could have been better, but it wasn't a bad penalty. But between Trippier's and Harry Kane, I mean, like they were they made sure that if it got to that point. There was no way they were going to lose, and given the recent history, I mean, like you, you would you would think that they would have that sort of attitude about it. Um, I thought that that was incredible, and you know, Russia's story was great. I mean, the the comeback against against Croatia just I I, I thought that that game was spectacular. I it's going it to go down to the history books. I mean, yeah. really, and, and of course they could have used the penalty kick training that England had, so that was a yeah. shame in the end. But it is what it is. So we've got uh, France going through. England plays uh, Croatia tomorrow. Any predictions on where that goes? Penalties. Wow. Penalties been... again. I mean, Croatia is just, they're, they're destined for penalties, three out of three. Um, and I think if it gets there, I think England has the edge. I mean, Pickford, you know, given the fact that he's, you know, 5'11", six foot at best with cleats on, you know, he's been, he's been incredible. And I, I don't think it's going to be a scoreless draw. I think there will definitely be some goals. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's going to be an, another incredible game because why, why wouldn't it be? I mean, this World Cup has just been legendary. Really. And and that's the beauty of it is it is completely unpredictable. We have no idea really what's going to happen, and that's what's really made this whole thing uh, fun. A definitely. lot more fun than last uh, four years ago when Germany just kind of stomped everybody and, and, and took it. So. Yep. We'll see what happens. We'll talk about it on the uh, on the next time and see where we ended up. Yep, I'll definitely be proved wrong, and it'll probably be a four nothing decision, England, and the furthest thing from penalties. But yeah, it is what it is. Yep. If I'm driving Uber in the next couple of weeks, you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know why because you lost all that money on Belgium, but that's that's another story. Yep, I'm sure I'll lose more because it's just not going to stop. Anyways, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about PRFC, right? Um, all right. This is a team that is on a hot streak, as hot a streak as a team can get on, with maybe one possible exception we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, 
I'm looking at the USL standings, and there's eight points, I think, between the top five teams, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some surprises. Uh, Portland Timbers that were, what, in uh, first place, what, a month ago, are now in, um, I think it's eighth place uh, or Drop sixth place. Yeah. I, I just, just crazy. Reno hasn't lost a game since, I want to get this date right, April 21st. They have not lost a game. That was a long time ago. That was a long, <laughs> long time ago. And they're sitting right behind us, and they're breathing down our neck, right? We're yeah. still behind Real Salt Lake, which I really don't care about. We have home field advantage in the number two spot. I'm good with that. But how do you see this, now that we're at the midway point, how do you see this playing out over the next couple of weeks? <sighs> um, it's going to be interesting. And you mentioned it to me before we hopped on just about – having this long of a break and then jumping back into it. The good news is, is that you're playing, I mean, a Fresno team that has been sort of hit or miss, right? They've had some really good results and then they've had some kind of crap results, but they have an enormous amount of talent. I mean, Wapla Bokafa, you know, his, his resume is some, is one of the best in, in the USL. Um, Jamal Johnson is basically, you know, the other JJ that's been dominating the Western conference. Um, you know, I really like, you know, Ronnie or get in the middle of the field just in terms of it, just in terms of being a workhorse. But, you know, on a bigger scale, it, it, it really is going to come down to how Phoenix performs against some of these top tier teams. I mean, they got this awesome result against Orange County. That's great. But don't rest your laurels on just one. Right. I mean, like everybody was wondering when that big game at home against one of the top five teams is going to come. It happened. Now, how do you respond? And especially coming off of a big 10 to 14 day break it's tough to just jump back into it. You know, it, it, it can be one of those things where you're sluggish, you come out of the gate slow and, you know, the rhythm isn't there defensively, you know, maybe, maybe not on the same page, although they haven't given up a goal basically since Reno lost the game. Um, but, you know, it's just one of those things where how they respond out of this break, I think is going to be huge because then it's just going to be a lot of games in rapid succession against some of the best teams. For me, you should get six points in these next two games going into the game against the Monarchs so that if you get a draw on the road, you can take that away as a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want the Monarchs to win a couple games because they're playing Seattle Sounders too, but then they have a tough game at San Antonio right before they play Phoenix. You want to go into that game on the front foot, six points out of, you know, out of those, out of these next two games. And where if you get a point on the road at Zion's, you come away and say, all right, we'll get the, we'll get them again. Or hopefully one of the other teams will knock them off. So it's still a lot of the season to be played, um, but it, it, it's going to be tough. And, you know, the, you, but let me ask you this. You're comfortable with a two seed? I am. Yeah, I'm good with the two seed. I don't have to be number one seed. All I want is a good home position uh, at the end of the at the end of the season. What counts to me is the playoffs and winning the cup. But you don't think that getting the one seed could, I mean, like it would be that big of a difference heading into a Western Conference final? Well, yeah, no, it would be a huge difference. No, no doubt about it. It would be a huge difference. Uh, emotionally, it would be a big difference. I mean, there's a lot of perks to being number one. But if we don't get it, I, you know what? I'm, I'm going into it with a lot, of, a lot of confidence. Yeah. Not the end of the world. I, I, I would tend to agree, but I think given how good Phoenix can be at home, it's, it, it, it would it would really behoove them to, to just go after during the regular season. Although you see what happened to the Monarchs when they did that and they lose in the first round. Maybe they were a little burnt out. So, you know, it's sort of a give and take with that. It's going to be a team management thing. And it's interesting you brought up the break thing. Uh, you know, Rick Schantz had a, a pretty good sound bites on uh, Twitter uh, that I think Jose uh, recorded the other day. And he talked about how when they had four days off um, when Cotteron was still here – that they came out of it. And he said that they, um, in fact, I did research because I want to make sure I didn't misquote, misquote Rick. He said, um, he says here that um, uh, we could talk about uh, how it's difficult to get one's head back in the game. After four days off, training wasn't sharp and energy level wasn't there. And you waste two to three days just getting them back. Um, this time they added the extra day. They started practice on Sunday instead of Monday. He felt like that was going to be important. And we did see that. And that was a big worry for PRFC is they came out of that break and they were a completely different and not very good team. Um, so how Rick reacts to that, how the team reacts to it when they come out to Fresno is going to be very important. Uh, what you're saying about getting those points uh, pre-real uh, Monarchs, 
totally, totally agree with. Um, very, very important. And Sacramento seems to be uh, doing not so well right now, right? So they've had a couple of losses, some tough games. Josh Cohen had a rough game. You know, that's usually who's saving it for Sacramento. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they face Real and, uh, and, uh, and come out of it. I just want to throw one thing out there. I love the banter on Twitter already between some of, you know, the, the marquee Phoenix Rising fans between yourself and John McPherson and everybody, you know, talk already talking about table and, and wishing for other results around the league. Like, I mean, it's only July 10th. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, you know, Mets fans that are hoping the nationals are going to lose in May. You know, it's like, it's, 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 that's very, very funny. It is. It is. It's maybe a little too soon, but I guess we just are like getting bored on Twitter or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's very possible, but I, I think that that's amazing. I mean, you guys are the best. <laughs> so let's talk, talk about Fresno for a minute because Fresno is actually kind of an unknown and they were back when we played them back on April 28th too but even more so now because in the past five games they've had three wins and they've had two losses okay they beat Sacramento which was huge right and they lost to Colorado which they had no business losing to the past two games they've had are both both been wins the last game was against the Timbers um, and it was not a convincing win. One was PK. One was a great, great uh, free kick taken by, um, you mentioned his name. What's his name? Um, uh, not Coach, uh, Katha. Katha uh, had that yep. uh, over the wall and in the net, and it was, it was a beautiful thing, probably, I don't know, 25 meters out. Um, it was a great uh, free kick. But uh, Fresno, I'm wondering if they are the same team that they were back in April and if PRFC is the same team that they were back then. Because if you remember, when we played Fresno, it was an ugly game. Dia got that red card. Mala and Rigi both got yellow cards. And then there were four yellows on Fresno. And I was ready to jump out of the stands. I was so pissed. I felt like they were starting to play some really dirty ball. And we were yelling stuff at them. Oh, my gosh. We were just – we were really talking smack from the stands. In fact, it was funny because Cotteron at one point turned around and looked at us, and my girlfriend was really pissed at me. <laughs> <laughs> if you're talking as much smack as you're telling me right now, I mean, I probably would be on her side as well. Yeah. But I will say this. I will say this. Well, two parts to this. So, what, so as far as Fresno and Phoenix being the same team, Fresno is a completely different team, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, they're an expansion side. With time, they've just grown. Whether those results have come or not, they haven't. I mean, that Colorado Springs game is, is example one, and I actually had the opportunity to talk to the coach of Fresno um, before their game against the Monarchs when they lost 1-0, goal in the eighth minute from Brody, and he said that that was the worst that they played this season, and that was the most he's led into, you know, he's ripped into them this entire season so far. So they sort of had like a coming to moment. They then played the Monarchs. It was a strange game on the road. Obviously, they just got worked in terms of possession. And then the Monarchs get an early goal, Fresno gets a red card, and then they just sort of sit in. But since then, they've responded with two very good wins against Sacramento and T2, like you mentioned. So I think that they're a side that sort of had that one big sort of team-changing moment in the middle of the season, which a lot of teams will have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Phoenix sort of had theirs with those two straight losses. And if you remember back to last year, the two straight losses were then followed by that 13-12 game unbeaten streak. So oh, those yeah. are... Those are the kind of moments in the middle of the season that can sort of set you up for, for really bad things, or they can set you up for really good things. <laughs> you know, T2 is kind of having one of those moments right now where it's sort of setting them up for bad things. So you see both sides of the coin with that. And as far as the matchup with Phoenix and Fresno is concerned, the coach of Fresno has not forgotten for an instance what happened with that challenge on Juan Pablo Caffa, his captain, who then ended up missing a few games after. I mean, that was – listen, I love Amadou. Seems like an awesome guy. I love watching him play. I was an outside back myself, and I appreciate everything that he does. But that was a nasty two-legged challenge. It was. So if there is any retribution to be had on the other – you remember back to that moment because there was – you know, Coach Smith was pretty clear as day that this was, you know – this is a challenge you did not forget. But, you know, it's not like there's unwritten rules or anything like that. I don't think there's going to be anything too malicious. But I think it's going to be a great game. Um, you know, Fresno has a lot of talent. Obviously, Phoenix is coming off of this break. So, you know, it's really up in the air. You know, if you, you were to take it to the to the odd makers in Vegas, you know, it would probably be a pick -up, especially especially the fact that, you know, Phoenix is coming off of this break. So 
I'm very excited to see what's going to go down. And then you mentioned also Duigi Mala getting a yellow card. I mean, the center back pairing is Mike Defon and Joseph Farrell. So let's see how this Fresno team deals with a Phoenix side that hasn't given up a goal in over a month. I mean, like that's also something that a lot of teams have in the back of their minds. I mean, we want to give, you know, clean sheet Carl as much credit as possible, but his back line has been, has been pretty sharp as well. They have been stellar, and, and that's probably the biggest, the biggest change between, between PRFC, PRFC in April and what we have today is the way we're handling things uh, defensively. Um, so I have a quote from you at the end of the last game. Um, and where is it? PRFC performance was gritty, gutty, and anything but glamorous. And I love that because it's a good rivalry. They're evenly matched teams, the amount of possession, number of shots, number of shots on goal, very equal across the board. Both teams really wanted it. They both played very hard. So some of these variables that you're talking about are going to be key to who comes out victorious, and it's going to be one heck of a game, no doubt about it. Plus, there's going to be Jameson and uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> was a dollar shots night at, at, at the complex. <laughs> well, I hope so. They just announced that um, we've got uh, Jameson and um, I can't think of the other whiskey, but they're the two whiskeys. I saw, I saw it. I, can't, I don't know the name of the other one, but I saw the Jameson. That got me excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready for that. <laughs> we'll send some to you long distance. <laughs> All right. okay. um, so, yeah, that is, that's going to be uh, a, a great matchup. Uh, this, I think, is um, going to prove what kind of a coach Rick is um, in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't know if you ever listened to Rising is uh, One podcast. Uh, they did a midseason poll, and I agreed with many of the poll results that they had, but one of them I totally really wasn't in line with was um, Rick Schantz as uh, the coach of the season so far over Patrice Cotteron. Um I think Patrice laid the foundation he has the wins. Rick's doing a great job. He has three wins under his belt now. That's all great. But he still has yet to prove himself. And I want him to, and I think he's the coach of the future for this team. Uh, but I think that uh, Cotterone is really uh, the reason why we are where we are and that Rick could take off over and it would be so smooth. Um, so do you feel like Rick's got any particular challenges coming up uh, this season, uh, you know, to finish off the season? Um, challenges, I wouldn't go as far to say challenges, but he's going to have some new experiences, right? I mean, he's going to have to deal with the fact of really hunkering down from a tactical standpoint and figuring out a way come postseason to just get a result. I mean, that's something that, that, that Phoenix failed to do last year, albeit it was a wild game. It took two days against Swope and, you know, it was just bizarre circumstances, but Swope figured out a way to, to win that game. I mean, it helped the fact that they were at home, but... I mean, the, that's that's what it's going to really come down to for Rick. I, listen, I, I've spent an enormous amount of time on the phone with both of them at this point, um, You know, particularly Patrice, more so Rick at this point, but both of them are outstanding. I'm not going to choose one side or the other, but I will say this is that I, I agree with you. I think that Patrice laid down the foundation and Rick has absolutely run with it, but they're different. I mean, even talking to them on the phone, they're very different. Rick is... Is, is much more of a, you know, he seems to just really embrace the whole the whole team concept. I mean, you know, when they scored that goal, when JJ scored that goal and everybody comes over um, and they said, and Rick said, this is who we are, you know, family, this this is it. You know, he embraces everybody. And that's what, when we asked, when Devin and I asked him, what's the difference with you and Patrice? You know, he said, I, I, I'm a bit more vocal with the boys. You know, not that Patrice wasn't animated and wasn't passionate about the game. If you're, if you're going to go ahead and say that about Patrice, you just don't know him or don't watch it. Um, but Rick really seems to embrace that. So I, so from like a energetic and a you know leader of men standpoint, I don't think he's going to face any challenges. But listen, he is the head coach of this team now, and him and, and Blair Gavin and the rest of the coaching staff are going to need to figure out ways, like you saw France today against Belgium, to tactically – pick out weaknesses of the other team, figure out their strengths, find a way to make them null and void, and go ahead and get a result. Because, listen, it, postseason is postseason. There's no two-legged format. You don't get an opportunity to go on the road and go up and, and play at home. It's one and done, baby. I mean, that's what, you know, it's, it's American sports and it's fine. So it's just one game, figure out a way to get it done. And I think that that'll be not a challenge for him, but a new experience and hopefully one that he'll, he'll take in stride. Uh, I agree with you. Um, I've loved the fact that he kept things uh, kind of normalized, you know, during the transition. He stuck with the four four two. It worked. It ain't broke. Don't fix it type of thing. But 
as we saw last year, teams are going to get used to our formations. We're going to have to start changing it up a little bit. We're going to have to adjust. And to me, that's where Rick's really going to really going to prove himself and really shine. And I, I really look forward to it because um, he has a different style than Patrice. Um, and I don't know him at all. I yell him out on the sidelines to say, hey, and that's that's it. You've had conversations with him. But uh, from my perspective, I, I do see he's more animated on the sidelines. You know, he's more uh, willing to run up and just hug the players afterwards. Um, I love the camaraderie he has and the fact that the team followed him as quickly as they did. I mean, it was immediate. There was no question about it. Just speaks volumes about the man and his leadership capabilities. Um, so we, we took something that potentially could have been a bad roller coaster ride and it turned it into a good one. Um, so I'm, it's, I just love change. I love unpredictability. Predictability to me is boring. BPL. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and so it's going to, it's going to be a fun ride. Um, Absolutely. so one other question I want to ask you, um, when it comes to the Eastern conference teams versus the Western conference teams, let's say if we're up there first place, second place, something like that, we, we get to the finals. How do you see us lining up with the Eastern conference teams? I mean, it, it, it's funny that you posed that question to me when you sent me that message on Twitter because, I, like, I sometimes have these, like, you know, strange sort of things going on in my head, like trying to compare sports and compare this and compare that. Like, for me, I, I see Eastern Conference teams as being much more defensive-minded. You know, when I think Eastern Conference, I think of, you know, a Louisville City that has a great – you know, back three, I think of a Pittsburgh Riverhounds team that doesn't give up goals basically as often as Phoenix does. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think of, of of an Indy 11 who is just sort of very methodical in the way they go about things. And then I think of the West and it's just sort of, you know, it, it, it's a, it's anybody's guess. You know, I think of Sacramento on the counterattack and the Cameron Wasses of the world. You know, I think about Phoenix and their ability to go forward. I think about, you know, Real Monarchs team who's just dizzying in the amount of possession that they're able to take. So, and then, I, and then I think about how that sort of relates to basketball. Now, now it's sort of, you know, totally tilted to one side with the Western Conference with LeBron coming to the Lakers. But for the longest time, it was the Eastern Conference were sort of these just like, you know, bash, you know, underneath the glass Eastern Conference gritty defensive teams. And the West, you know, you think about the Warriors and the Thunder just putting the Rockets, putting up 110 points per game. And why, why does that sort of become a correlation between the West and the East, even cross sport? So... For me, I see the Eastern Conference as just much more defensive. And then a Phoenix team going up against a team like Pittsburgh or a team like Louisville, it, it would be such a good matchup, right? And I mean, think about think about the likes of Joe Greenspan and Hugh Roberts of the Pittsburgh Riverhounds trying to deal with Solomon Asante and Jason Johnson going forward because they don't see that kind of pace out in the Eastern Conference. I mean, they just don't. They're they're dealing with a Louisville team that's very methodical. Cameron Lancaster from Louisville isn't lightning quick. Luke Spencer is by no means quick, but they get the job done in tight areas. But, and that's why they were so effective last year. But, you know, before we jump the gun and say who they're going to take on in the final, I think there's a lot of work to be done in the West because all of the Western teams are very like-minded in the sense that they like to go forward. And that, you know, a lot of it is attacking football, not to say that Phoenix can't play, can't play clean sheet football because they have been for the entire month of June, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's very interesting. Even, you know, thinking cross board, about the concepts of what sort of style of play exists where in the country and somehow the west has embraced that concept of being the wild wild west and offensive attacking style in any sport and the same thing in the eastern conference just in terms of being you know gritty gruesome and anything but glamorous patient the word i always hear is patient you know they're patient and we're just like ripping down the sidelines uh yes. interesting uh I don't know a lot about the Eastern Conference teams, but what little I have seen, what you're saying makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, that'll make the matchups fun. There's just no doubt about it. Um, Absolutely. You know, the USL, I mean, the quality of ball we see, and you compare it to what we see in the World Cup, at least when it comes to results and just overall uh, excitement, is very comparable. Um, and that's what makes this this league you know, so, so fun. It almost makes me want to stay in the USL instead of going to the MLS, but I want to go to the MLS. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, I really want to see us go up against Atlanta United and a couple of other teams and oh. just beat them and just, you know, <laughs> just go in and beat them. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway. I, want, I want nothing more than that. That would be fantastic. Oh, it would just be so fun. Um, I have a lot of Atlanta United friends, so it's just like I want to just stick it to them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyways, I, I think that's what I've got for this week. Have you have, do you have anything else you want to add at this point? I just, I just want to see them play another game. I feel like it's been, you know, about a month and a half since I've seen them play. I'm ready for Fresno. Yeah, I am definitely ready for Fresno. So that's the Friday the 20th. It's going to be a big night. Um, I guess what we'll do is we'll see how it turns out, and we'll talk about it afterwards. All right, beautiful. Sounds good to me, Kevin. Tyler, thank you so much for your time, buddy. My pleasure. Take care. That's going to wrap it up for this first episode. I hope you enjoyed it. We are looking at doing all sorts of things. In fact, this is the bare bones version. I've got all sorts of things, a theme song and opening graphics and everything I still need to put together. But we did record the session. We wanted to get it out. So just expect things to kind of grow and expand and morph and become better over time. In the meantime, enjoy the World Cup final this weekend and enjoy the PRFC game on Saturday night as they take on Fresno FC. And we'll see you next week.